Добрый день. Welcome everybody. This is Super Info Media Center. My name is Olga Tamanova. Welcome to everybody joining us today. It's the tenth year of the war today, the five hundred and forty one days since the beginning of the occupation of our land. Today we are talking about a important thing, the treatment of the prisoners of war. We all know how the norms of the international law is misused by the Russian forces. We've seen our prisoners of war coming back. Today we'll be talking about how Ukraine applies and commits to the international law. Our speakers today is Mr. Yusuf representing the military intelligence of Ukraine. We're also having people representing the Ukraine's uh, I Want to Live project in Ukraine. I, Mr. Yusuf, I would like to ask you in the first place, what's going on in this sphere? How the prisoners of war are treated, where they are detained, what are the conditions? The floor is yours. Welcome, everybody. Today's event will include a couple of parts. It, we will not be only persons who will be speaking. But first things first, as for the treatment of the Russian detainees and prisoners of war, you will hear the assessment of the international organizations. This is an open domain information, and perhaps some of you visited the places where the Russian POWs are detained. The thing is that we are dealing with the invading forces and genocidal force against Ukraine with a number of uh, war criminals committed by the Russian force. Ukraine is a civilized country living up to the international standards and we detain and provide conditions for the Russian prisoners of war according to the Geneva Conventions. Over the last weeks, the number of Russian POWs has grown and grown dramatically. Over the couple, last couple of weeks, both defending actions and our actions in an assault front, our prisoners of war that we have taken has grown, which means that it'll, it will be more easier for us to exchange them. Out of all the prisoners of war, every fifth has surrendered voluntarily. Every day we see th from three to five persons in the framework of the state-run program, I Want to Live. And of course, we'll be talking about that program in detail later on. The so-called Minister of Defense of the so-called Russian Federation, Mr. Shegu, stated a very strange thing. He said that one of the priorities that they pursue in the so-called special military operation is returning of the Russian prisoners of war back to Russia. It's an amazing statement. It differs dramatically from what they claim to be the goal of the military operation at the inception of war. But we want to see the actions, not the words. We are ready to give them back, of course, in exchange of our prisoners of war, and including the civil personnel that have been detained illegally. This all comes down to the treatment of the Russian prisoners of war. Unfortunately, it's the Russian Federation that is blocking the exchange process. And indeed, they are not interested in the fate of the prisoners of war that are detained here in Ukraine. Perhaps these words by the Minister of Defense of Russia will serve as a trigger for people in the Russian Federation to ask more questions. That is to say, what the Russian authorities are doing themselves to unleash this aggressive war, and in general, why these people are here. Once again, we reiterate the point that Ukraine is ready. Now, the regime that has unleashed this bloody war has to do something in as a response, not without bending the Geneva Conventions, but do something positive in terms of essential things. We will be very active. 
in terms of our liberating our territories, meaning that the Russian prisoners of war will grow, their number will grow. This will also be the hot topic for some time to come. Of course, we are ready to answer your questions. I would like to give the floor to my colleagues. Sir, could we go into details on how the Russian POWs are treated? Welcome. As Mr. Yuso has suggested, you may have visited the places where the Russians, Russian prisoners of war are detained. You've seen that firsthand. For those who have not been there, I will tell you in a nutshell how the conditions look like according to the international humanitarian law. Indeed, these people who have come here to kill, to destroy us as a nation, to pillage our homes, we treat them in accordance in particular with the third Geneva Conventions on the treatment of the prisoners of war. The camp is located in the western part of Ukraine. According to the Geneva Convention, the camp has to be situated far away from the zone of military action, where the conditions are guaranteed for them to work, and the Russian soldiers do work. Officers have the right to refuse to work, but majority of them work, and they have done that voluntarily. The work is not that difficult. There are a lot of questions why that particular work is assigned to them. And we will answer that question at a later stage. They have also a possibility to have some rest. They are fed three times a day, quality food, well, with a lot of calories, international organizations, including the Red Cross, are constantly inspecting, not on a one-off footing. They visit those places for a week, for example, and every day spend a couple of hours per day. They are asking the prisoners of war about the conditions of Ukraine, showing our openness, our desire to be seen the way we are treating the invading force. And we demand that Russia treat our prisoners of war in a similar way. As you see on the screen, the way they are fed. Well, good quality food, unlike the way the, our people are treated. They are getting weight here unlike ours, losing weight all the time. There's a church on the premises where you can serve your religious needs. There are Muslims, and there is a special place for them, for their namaz praying. There is also a medical treatment guaranteed. A lot of the POWs have suffered from different wounds and traumas, including difficult cases. The equipment is there, beginning from the x-ray equipment, procedure equipment and rooms, and there are specialists that are taking care of them. Sometimes they are treated in a way that they were not treated back home. What we are showing is that we show everybody that staying in the Ukrainian captivity guarantees you decent conditions that the Russian soldiers should not fear that they will be ill-treated the way they deserve, but we treat them in a way that international norms demand. We show it to everybody. You can stay in the Ukrainian captivity until the war ends. You can surrender, and then you will choose your own way. On Sunday, there's a day off, you can go in for sport, there is playing ground, a football pitch. When the weather is good, they play football, as you can see, and there are a lot of things that are not accessible to our people, to our defenders who are detained by the Russian Federation. As the coordination center 
our task is to pressure through international channel, the Russian Federation, through the international channels on organizations, helping the Red Cross organization to live up to its mandate, to live up to their mission, to visit all the places where our people are detained, our prisoners of war, and there are more than 80 places in Russia and in the temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine. We are setting up such visits and everyone can be assured that the conditions for the Russian prisoners of war are good. You see, it's very difficult to look at the picture and compare the conditions of our people in Russia and the conditions we provide. Everyone knows, and we go to our third panelist about the program, I Want to Live. How many people from Russia have taken advantage of that? The government state project, I Want to, to Live, was set up in 2022. It's working effectively. Our main task is to preserve the lives of the Russian soldiers who do not wish to fight here in Ukraine, against Ukraine, who do not want to carry out the criminal orders. People who have been forcefully mobilized, who have been thrown here to Ukraine to kill our people. Stat statistically speaking, over the last year, we have uh, received more than 22,000 requests. The site has been accessed on the, in the north of 42 million. Most of them come from the Russian Federation. I would like to stress that four leaders are cities of Moscow, St. Petersburg, Krasnodarsky region, and region of Nizhny Novgorod. We have 10 operators working on the hotline, and they are processing up to 100 requests per day. The Russian authorities are monitoring our resources, and uh, they have blocked 256 sites of our resources. But the information is there. The information is on the internet, it is available, and the Russians who have not been mobilized yet, as well as their relatives, can um, get to familiarize themselves about the people who have surrendered voluntarily, because they are enjoying some privileges, including the possibility of the exchange of prisoners of war. They can stay there until the end of the war. They can ask for the asylum here or in Ukraine. And as you have seen and heard, the conditions in the camp are quite comfortable. Many Russians have been wondering that such conditions are possible. They didn't believe that it was possible. But the information is available. And uh, sometimes, you know, when it comes down to calling home and the phone calls we receive, we hear some amusement or even respect to the way Ukraine differs from Russia. There are absolutely different people that is shown in how we treat the prisoners of war here. As for the I Want to Live project, we are now launching an initiative for the citizens of the Russian Federation who are, do not support the Putin regime, and they are vocal about their opposition to war, and the Russian regime tries to imprison them. That is why the I Want to Live project has initiated such a project, something that we'll be dealing with in the future. We'll be helping such politically suppressed people in the Russian Federation through different channels in different way. This is only the beginning of the way. We will divulge such information later on. But to free a politically repressed person in the Russian Federation, we think it can be done in the way of exchanges because we have collaborators here in the territory of Ukraine. Prisoners of war, swaps is one thing, but the initiative 
on the politically repressed persons is another side of the coin. Dear colleagues, Mr. Yusuf has suggested this is an interactive meeting. You will have the opportunity to ask questions, and then I will ask you to switch off your cameras. We will have a two-minute break before we begin that part. Now the questions from the floor. Can you just uh, elaborate on one of the things you said near the beginning? Uh, you said in the last couple of weeks the number of Russian POWs had grown dramatically. Can you give us a sense of what you mean by grown dramatically? Can you quantify that at all for us? Thank you. Thank you for the question. The Coordination Center on Treatment of Prisoners is the same. We do not comment on the number of Russian POWs here as we don't comment on the number of the Ukrainian prisoners of war in Russia because the negotiations of the prisoner swaps are very difficult and this information is sensitive, as you will know, and can impact the course of the negotiations. The Red Cross organization is in a position to comment on the number of the POWs that have been officially stated by the Red Cross organization. I would like to go back to the numbers. Can we specify the number of the prisoners who have been accused of the criminal actions? And there are rumors that Russia is about to begin a new wave of mobilization. We know that this creeping mobilization is still going on, but can we expect the number of uh, these uh, draftees to grow? Indeed, in Russia, the mobilization campaign is in full swing. And every day, every month, they recruit about 20,000 personnel are getting mobilized. Moscow's mayor has suggested that 45,000 Moscovites that he claimed are here in the occupied territories of Ukraine. Before that, the number was 35,000, which means that the mayor of Moscow has admitted that there are 10,000 Moscovites that have been mobilized. The methods are different, but the campaign is still going on. They are forced to sign contracts or in any other way. They are talking about the duress. People are forced, barring the children of the millionaires, no, these are people coming to work from Eastern Republics of the former Soviet Union. Because to get a Russian passport, you are liable to be mobilized, which means that otherwise people are getting caught by the Putin regime to go to Ukraine to be killed or to be imprisoned. And because Ukraine is living up to the international humanitarian law and Geneva Conventions, the only way for the Russian military to stay alive, to surrender voluntarily or to be captured. And when we capture them, of course, we also are in line with the international humanitarian law. But then we are talking about people being wounded or being killed. But yielding yourself a prisoner is a way to be to stay alive and to be held in a more or less human conditions. You have to refuse to be part of the criminal uh, crimes and war crimes. As for the collaborators, we are talking about something in the vicinity of 1,000 people and the war crimes in the territory of Ukraine. Russian prisoners of war that have been accused of criminal war, criminal uh, war crimes, as Mr. Shishnar, the statistics is very dynamic. The data are available, and of course the new cases are filed and investigations are be begin. Enzo Cremonesi for the Italian Daily. 
Corriere della Sera from Milano. Uh, sir, uh, so I understood uh, clearly you uh, cannot comment on numbers, figures of your prisoners or Russian prisoners. All right. But can we ask you how many had been exchanged up till now? What, what is the figure of the two sides? How many Ukrainians were freed up till now and how many Russian were freed up till now? And I would like to ask you to clarify, these 22,000 are Russian soldiers, you mentioned before this number, who are in Russia, who are interested in your program, I want to leave? I mean, they're still Russian soldiers. They're not, they're not in Ukrainian jails, correct? Or detention camp? Indeed, 22,000 people have expressed their desire to be part of this project. This is a very sensitive project. It is fraught with dangers. There is a lot of work to be done in terms of preparation. There's, there are a number of stages. Of course, you've got to get them over the state border. 22,000 is the number of people who have expressed the desire. They are being vetted. They are being processed. As for the number of the people coming back, this is unprecedented data. The Geneva Conventions do not provide for the prisoner exchange during the war. Now that the war is raging on, Ukraine is getting the, our defenders back. We have conducted so far 48 exchanges, and uh, our defenders and civilians have come back from the Russian captivity. In many cases, when we talk about civilians, we can't even use the word captivity. These are people that have been illegally detained in Russia. They, not should, sh they should not have been there at all. There is no legal basis for them, even from the point of view of the dic Russian dictatorship. This is the abduction of people. 2000, more than 2,000 people have come back within the framework of the eight, 48 exchanges. The work is going on. We expect that there is a good news coming our way, good news for our defenders and for their families, but there is a lot of work to be done. Has any one of the prisoners of war expressed their desire to join Ukrainian armed forces or they are not in a position while they are prisoners of war? There are instances of that kind including the prisoners of war that are detained in our camps among the Russian military. Radio Freedom. Mr. Yusuf, I'd like to turn to you. I understand that the general figure cannot be voiced, but can you tell us how many of them, which part is the officers and which part are soldiers? Mr. Vitali, what is the frequency when you have requests at the I want to leave project are these soldiers who are they what are they I will not tell you the number of officers but we have both major officers and minor officers including the over the last week the group that you saw on television includes officers as for the requests the map looks like that. The majority of them are soldiers, because there are more of them, but we have enough officers as well. When we conduct such operations, when we get them into Ukrainian territory, both officers and soldiers surrender, and they come our way with their arms. Deutsche Welle, does this program, I Want to Live, cover the Ukrainians who have been mobilized in the occupied territories? And if so, which is the share of the Ukrainians who have surrendered since the program began? What is the chance of them to ask for the asylum in Ukraine 
or in other countries? How many people have taken advantage of that opportunity? Can you tell us the numbers in terms of the Ukrainians or the countries where they had received asylum? Did I understood you correctly that as for the political uh, political prisoners in Russia, that they will be exchanged for the Ukrainian collaborators. Can you talk on that? Indeed, we are talking about the Russian citizens that are detained in Ukrainian prisoners. They have been uh, accused of crimes. They are not military personnel. They want to go back to Russia. Ukraine stands ready to do that. And of course, in spite of the fact that the majority of Russians have been zombied and they root for the genocide of the Ukrainian population, there are those who are not afraid to speak against this bloody war. They support Ukrainian strive for struggle for independence. The draconian laws provide a lot of years in prison. And Ukraine, as a European democratic country, we see it as an incumbent upon us to help them. I think that the whole world understands that apart from the genocide against Ukraine, we are talking about the terror within the Russian Federation herself. We are ready to get those people to Ukraine. Our priorities, to be sure, is the prisoners of war. Prisoners of war will not be exchanged in a way, but such types as Mr. Medvedchuk and their likes, of course, they are held here, there, they will be, we are ready to exchange them. There are people in Russia who have been strong enough to condemn the genocidal war against Ukraine, and we will support those Russians who stand against and voiced their position facing such draconian measures. As for the Ukrainians who have been forcefully mobilized in the occupied territories, the answer is positive. And I'm talking about the Donetsk and Lugansk regions and the Crimea. It's a regular practice. We receive requests from them and they're being helped. As for their asylum, is it in Ukraine or elsewhere? As for the Ukrainian condition, we guarantee them that they will not be forcefully returned to Russian Federation, and there is a possibility for them to be granted a political asylum here in Ukraine. As for other countries, these types of questions will be settled down after the Ukraine's victory. Newspaper El País. Uh, last March, uh, United Nations Human Rights Mission in Ukraine stressed in a report that uh, there were war crimes against prisoners of war, not only in the Russian side, but also in the Ukrainian side. Uh, United Nations also underscored that Ukraine was willingly, was m more open to, to cooperate and to improve the situation. I would like to know, since that report that was released in March, how have you improved uh, the, I don't know, safety or the, the, the point where, for example, prisoners of war uh, surrender and nothing happens to them? Thank you. Uh, Thank you for your question. Indeed, we are aware of that report by the United Nations. Because Ukraine has been open and grants a full access to the POWs in our camps, and the information is available, we believe that because of that, the report is unbalanced. Russia is not granting access to are prisoners of war. So the general impression is that the number of violations of international law is somewhere equal. In fact, this is not. They are visiting 
the places where the Russian military are held here, and there is a feedback. Once we see some violations, we try to make good on them. In summer, the representatives from the United Nations visited, in particular, the camp for the Russian prisoners of war. What we have seen is that they are changing their angle, and we believe that the next report will be more objective, more balanced, without this prejudice that Ukraine is granting full access, but the aggressor country does not provide such an information. We know that United Nations has claimed that Russia has failed to grant access of their inspectors to the places where the prisoners of war are detained. The situation is still going on. Kiev Independent newspaper. You mentioned the conditions for the forcefully mobilized. These people that are citizens of Ukraine, are they victims of the occupation? Do you treat them in a such a way? And then civilians from Russia, that people like Sergei Karmazin, who has been held in Russia. On the first point, we differentiate between different things because it all comes down to investigation. We want to know the motives, the circumstances of a mobilized person, whether they have committed criminal uh, war crimes or they have been carrying out criminal orders. Such conditions have to be checked. The other thing is that sometimes, on separate occasions, people are forcefully mobilized in the Ukrainian temporarily occupied territories, even if they are not holders of the Russian passport. This is for you to know who we are dealing with. And then about the genocidal war and the evidence of that. While they're talking about the so-called partial mobilization, in Russia, in the Ukrainian temporarily occupied territories, the mobilization from the day one of the full-scale invasion, we have seen a total mobilization. They don't actually have enough men to be mobilized. The students in Moscow universities attend classes. The students in Donetsk universities, for example, are thrown into the front line at the cannon fodder, because Putin understands that they either will be killed or will be in prison. This is the way the Ukrainians are treated in the temporarily occupied territories. Hopefully, I have answered your question. As for the civilians, you see, it's not a matter of illegal detentions. What Russia is doing is that they do not recognize the civil rights of the Ukrainians. They don't recognize the right of the Ukrainian people to live. Their genocidal position has nothing to do with the international law. How come that Ukrainians from Kherson, Bucha, Hostopil, they have found themselves in the territory of Russia, either in the specialized prisons or the places where are people are not supposed to live. Filtration camps, for example. Russia has not come up with a satisfying explanation of how these things have come to be. This is unacceptable in terms of the human international humanitarian law. However, people are coming back. There is a very special serious work on the part of Ukrainian human rights ombudsman and from our staff and the this called the staff of the treatment of the pre prisoners of war but we also see that they are dealing with the civilians yes the returns are taking place luckily enough there, there have been some successes here but there is a lot of work for the future now that we have to live up to our security measures. I would like to switch off your cameras and in a couple of minutes we will continue our work.
Друзі, ми можемо продовжувати на... Ladies and gentlemen, we will resume our work. It is off record. You, the floor is yours. In order to confirm the conditions of provided for the prisoners of war with their consent and their desire, we are now giving you the opportunity to talk to them with with the Russian prisoners of war that are currently being held as captives. One by one, they will share with you, they will talk about who they are, and you will have the opportunity to ask them personally. Please be mindful, your questions should be correct and should not insult their decency because this will violate the Geneva Conventions. I underline these people have come here voluntarily. They have expressed their desire to witness here and please mind that questions should consider the history of every one of them. If the person is not able to answer that question, they have the right to refuse to answer the question. Shall we begin? Let me also say that all the questions will be asked within the framework of this event. Later on, you will not have such an opportunity. Please take advantage of this right now. I would like to give the floor. Shall we begin with you, sir? Tell us who you are. My name is Prokhorov. My name is Sergei. I come from Mariupol. This is where I was born. I grew up there and lived there. At the end of February, early March, the hostilities came to Mariupol, and I was at home, living a private house. The city was heavily bombed. The aircraft bombed our district. We were bombarded. After the active hostilities ceased in, in the city of Mariupol, there is no work available. The only work available was to sort out the rumbles of the destroyed houses. And I joined that force. We were given humanitarian aid. According to the lists, we received foods as humanitarian aid. And of course, one set of the given food was not enough for one month. So you had to go to work and then different development projects came from Russia, and I joined such project, work on the building. We were fitting in the plastic windows. I was doing some roofing, making cement. At first, the salary was quite good. It was enough to live. Later on, they didn't pay in time, many companies did not pay at all, or they didn't pay on time. And then there's an information campaign to join Russian forces. And I went to the military recruitment office. I was promised high salary, about 204,000 rubles. They promised me that I would stay in the rear, that my unit would stay in rear, in the rear, and I gave my agreement. It was on the 21st of June this year. And the way panned out, not the way I thought they would. In a month's time, I found myself on the front line, and in a week's time, the fir my first uh, fight. I was wounded and was captured 
I was f wounded with uh, shrapnel. I was taken to the Ukrainian hospital. They took the shrapnel away and they treated me good in the Ukrainian hospital. They gave me all the help I needed. I'm sorry for what I have done and I admit to what I have done and I feel sorry for this. I hope that I will be swapped for the Azov prisoners of war. I believe that according due to the state of health, I will be decommissioned and I will not take arms into my hands and I will continue working. Everybody, welcome to you all. I think for us to cooperate better, you perhaps should ask me questions to begin with. Well, my name is Ramis. My family name is Kirkinov. And my patronymic is Akhmetovich. I was born in the city of Vladikavkaz. Used to be Arjenikidze in the North Ossetia region. I will be turning 60 years and I will be celebrating the Jubilee here. I got engaged in these actions at the beginning of May. I was imprisoned, charged with Article 212, Organization of Mass Disorders. You see, I held my personal views on the things that were surrounding me and my country. I saw things differently from the official point of view. That's why I was imprisoned. As they say in Russian, I found myself in the places far away from my hometown. I spent three years behind bars Following that, our prison was visited by the representative of the Ministry of Defense, and they offered something, an offer that I was forced not to turn down. That is to say, the offer was like this. We are, you are, going to the front line to defend the Luhansk People's Republic and Donetsk People's Republic. You see, at that point, being in prison, I didn't have any objective, true information. So I took that offer as a normal one. That is to say, I thought to myself, I was not going to be an occupier. This is not that I want to, you know, be squeaky clean here. This is the way I saw the situation. I thought we will be defend defending these two people's republics. And I asked them whether I was, in terms of age, did I uh, fit in? I told them I will be turning 60 very soon. They told me that people like you will be working on the development projects, buildings. This is the way I understood them. This is how I found myself in the ranks. We were Flown, flown off to Rostov, somewhere there, where we had a preparation course. We were sent to some place, the place I don't know where I was, I just don't know where we were. But frankly speaking, I didn't care, because there was too much information in my head. Different settlements that we were moving to and fro. Finally, 
at the destination point, that was a wood. Woods. The, the people who were older were given shovels and were sent to dig up the trenches. Well, we got there, three of us, we began to dig. We dug a dug hole, a very good one. And in three days' time, there were people coming our way, and they said, you move forward. And we will be staying here in this dug hole that you've made. And I am telling them, this is not the right way to follow. I don't have enough strength to dig a new one. Well, I had to leave that place. Well, we dug another. With the guy that we were digging with, this shelter, this dugout. This is the way we lived and used to dig. That dugout was not sheltered. We didn't have tools. It was an open shelter. Two weeks of hard work. And my, I had a back pain. I broke my back. Well, I was offered to keep on working. And then my legs failed me. I could not be transported. I couldn't walk. And they told me, sit aside and don't interrupt our work. And I told them, I cannot move. If something happens, I won't be able to move. I think they didn't give a damn. And, you know, when you are under the massive bombardment, people go to shelters and... Um, I understood that I couldn't move. I didn't have enough strength to move or to hide. I was sitting there like I was. And the last two days, the key moment in my story, the massive bombardment that we saw, there was enough strength for me to get to the dugout and I sheltered there. What was then? my memory fails me you were captured weren't you well there were no other options I couldn't move second day there was bombardment no one gave me any help I couldn't move on my own and in this dugout I lost conscience, and in the morning, I hear the voice, get out, whoever is there, and I understood that these were Ukrainian military. I thought, of course, I have to get out of that if I could, and I told them, I will have a smoke, and then I will get out, and they told me, do as you wish. They, we were not physically abused. They took me to some point where I was transferred to some other place that seemingly was a garage. They rendered me some medical help. The doctor came to see me and the doctor made sure that I could move. He did a very good job. Thank you, sir. My name is Lebedev Nikita Vladimirovich. I was born in the city of Luhansk and lived in the Lugansk region. Study, the preparation course, was very swift. You know, I was a student when the hostilities were very active. I was 13 years old when the war began. Well, upon the graduation, uh, it was difficult to find a job. In fact, there was no jobs available. And here some time passes and there are some prospects to join the military. Well, I didn't give it too much thought. I thought I would join. 
And I signed a contract before the full-scale invasion. I disrupted one of those contracts and I left the military, but after the 24th, there was a military call. I didn't respond to it because I had some things to reconcile with the military unit. My commander said, come and we'll see what we can do. And I came to that unit, military unit and stayed there. Until April, I was serving in the rear. And after service in the rear, I was sent to the hostilities zone, in particular, the city of Rubizhne, Lysychansk. At that point, I was in the formation that was convoying the major core. Our mission was to overlook the place and to demine fields or, biz or, or homes or buildings. And in parallel, we did the humanitarian demining. That is to say, we were cooperating with the local authorities, the water supply system and electricity lines. We were following these electricity lines and demining the adjacent territories. Then we were embedded with the 7th Brigade and I was captured there near the village of Bilohorivka. I stayed there, there for a short time. On the 5th of 4th, I think, we were taken there. On the 9th, I was captured. How did I get captured? Shall I say it was beautifully done. The Ukrainian soldiers were waiting for us in a position that we visited for a number of hours. It was quite quiet for two days. And when we got to the position, there were six of us to mine that position because we were laying mines after, before and after us. And uh, I had to go together with the commander and once I got down to ma to lay mines I thought there was some something going on and I understood that they we were encircled our commander was taken prisoner and this is the first time that I was captured this is my second time of imprisonment you were here in Ukrainian prisoners of war system when was it I stayed here from January to February and second time was captured in May. You were exchanged first time, right? Correct, thank you. My name is Kalashnikov Evgeny Alegovich. I am the Ukrainian citizen from the Donetsk region, the city of Nova Avazovsk. Since 2014, when I was 14 years old, when all those things began, over these years, I lived there, was a student at the Nash Donetsk Polytechnical Universities. I was doing some video work. I was interested in acting. And when it all began on the 24th of February, I set up a telegram called the burying of our future, the death of our future. And I was hiding from the mobilization which is in Russian called also the death mobilization. And it was stupid of me to go into the city and I shot the strategic object, the bridge. The local bridge was blown up that, by that time. And there was a lot of traffic, the dragon's teeth, everything, every equipment was going through that bridge. I made a, a shot and I was taken by the FSB. The Russian FSB was us, were asking me, do you work for the Ukrainian Secret Service? Who are the group members? How many of you are there? I was kept for a month in the 
uh, underground. They misused me and abused me, beat me, and they thought that it's just a stupid person, and uh, it's by his stupidity that he did this video shooting, and they thought that it was good for me to repent my sins by going to the front line. In spite of the fact that I was a Ukrainian citizen, they made me talk on camera that where I claimed that I was a victim of the Ukrainian regime on the U Ubenko Telegram channel that said that I was the mouthpiece, mouthpiece of the Ukrainian fascist, and now I was a uh, Ukrainian vampire. They gave me a grenade for it to have my fingerprints. And they said, if you don't join our forces, don't go to front, we will lay that grenade with your fingerprints in your home and you will be criminally charged. So the, I was sent then to Pantelimonovka. We were I was supposed to be te learning the profession of the U UVA operator. And I was seeking for the opportunity to get away from there because according to the Putin's legislation, as a student, I could be relieved, but they wouldn't let me go. The militaries told me, the Russian FSB brought you here, the Russian FSB will get you out of here. That's the only way to go. Somewhere in April, on the 1st of April, I was caught in terms of the correspondence that they didn't like. And they made me join the storm force, and I was supposed to go first. I was never planning to fight against Ukraine. I am a Ukrainian citizen. And once I was in that situation, I was planning to surrender. I always had with me a white t-shirt and I was looking for the opportunity to surrender and I remember the Ukrainian UVA was on over our heads and the people from Donetsk People's Republic scattered away and I ran for three or four hundred or even five hundred meters along the field waving my white t-shirt and crying that I am surrendering, don't shoot. And uh, I surrendered to the Ukrainians and told the Ukrainians that there was a storm being planned in 24 hours. This is the way I helped my country. The Ukrainian SBU relieved me of all charges and I refused to be exchanged. I'm not going back to the Russian mirror, to the Russian uh, world sphere. My mother and my granny and grandpa are here in Ukraine now. My charges have been relieved and I will be relieved according to the Geneva Convention. I will be a free person. I have not um, I have not been planning to do anything against Ukraine. This is just the way things developed. I, I'm not a traitor of my country. Remember, before you start questioning about the procedure that we have asked about you, Natalia Malchanova, Ukrain Forum. I would like to turn to you, sir. Can you share with us the thing, the people from Donetsk or Lugansk, they're supposed to be Ukrainian citizens, correct? they will be part of the exchange program. The guy from the Lugansk region said that he, he's not going to be exchanged. A short answer is every prisoner is taken s separately. There has to be an investigation in every case. We have just heard about the situation when the person has been forcefully taken. He will not be prosecuted. If the investigation will show that the person was committing war crimes and there will be investigation and the consequences to be faced. An important thing here is this. 
a request to be exchanged for a particular person from the Russian Federation and his or her desire to be exchanged. If one element is lacking, then we take that point off the agenda. And another question to Nikita and the Lega. Do I remember your name correctly? Zhenya. Well, I understood that you were 13, 14 years old when the war began, the war, the Russia-Ukraine war. You were what? As a student in a school, you were a school children. Did you consider any chance to go to Ukraine and continue your education, whether a vocational school or university? What was your plan? Did you think about such a development? And if so, why, why didn't it come out? You, you see, I didn't think about that. My parents are old. They have to be taken care of on a regular basis. Relatives are not there. I am the only one to help them. And after school, I was student at the vocational school there in my city. This is the way it went. In my case, yes, I was a attending a school and I graduated from school when it was already People's Republic. My mother decided that I should stay in the Donetsk People's Republic for me to stay closer to her, next to her, shall I say. She is a fearful person in that trip. You see, she was going through Russia to Latvia and Poland. She suffered a lot during that journey. She is such a fearful person. And I was dreaming of going to Europe. I was not planning to stay in the Donetsk People's Republic. But my mother encouraged me to stay with her. And what it has led to? It has led to almost my being a traitor of my country. Two questions to you, sir. Were you brainwashed in this school the Russia propaganda, where you told that there is no such thing as Ukraine. Can I turn to you? Do you enjoy dual citizenship or do, are you a citizen of Ukraine? And did I understand you that you want to voluntarily be exchanged to Russia? Indeed, I have a dual citizenship. I am a citizen of Ukraine. I have a passport in my home. This year, in January, I received a Russian passport, and I became a Russian citizen. I want to be exchanged. I want to go home. As for the school, overall, until the ninth grade, I didn't see any changes, any differences in terms of how they taught us the history of Ukraine. We had a subject called the Ukrainian history. After the ninth grade, there were some additions, new facts. They added some facts about this war. And the history said and told us that Ukraine has invaded the Donbass region. That's the way it was. In my case, the situation is as follows. Our principal of the school, he was a history teacher. When everything began, he voluntarily went to war he was not a principal of our school. He was at war. I don't know what he did there, but when he came back, he was imposing this idea of the Russian world on us. He was not my teacher of history. My teacher of history was very good. He was talking about what Nazism is, what fascism is. But that principal, I don't know what he was teaching his students. 
at the at his initiative, the initiative by the principal, kids were taken to the firing ground and we were firing the Kalashnikov and other automatic submachine guns. And this is what they did with us. The director was an enthusiast of uh, such a teaching process. His last name is Baradenko. I don't remember his name. Ukraine TV channel. As living, as you lived in Luhansk or Donetsk or in Russia, did you know about the project I Want to Live? Do the Russian military know about such projects? And what do they do to make sure that the Russian military would not surrender to the Ukrainians? Are they tortured? Have you ever heard about your brothers in arm being tortured? As for the program, I want to live. I knew and I was planning to take advantage of that, although I failed. In December, I was at the front line. I had a telephone and I con contacted the hotline I want to live, but I failed to get through. And I heard the information that the priority is for the groups beginning with 15 people. And I was watching television and YouTube, YouTube channel, Mr. Aristovich and Fagan, and they said that this project doesn't work the way it was supposed to do. The hotline is overloaded. This is exactly the situation that I experienced. In April, when I was at the front line, my cellular phone was taken away from me. I was deprived of my Ukrainian passport or the military card. And this is where I had to go, you know, as it will develop. I was groping for the way to yield myself to the Ukrainians. To the person from Mariupol, you're saying that you want to go home. What is your home? And second point, in fact, you seem to be having three citizenships. I have two citizenships, Ukrainian and Russian. I didn't receive the Donetsk People's Republic passport. I received the Russian passport. I was born in Mariupol. I am 48 years old. This is my home. This is where my friends and my acquaintances are. Have your house been ruined? The city has suffered a lot. It, it lies in ruins. But my house seems to be intact. Well, you know, minor damages like the windows have been blown away but I've been lucky otherwise. Questions from the floor, ladies and gentlemen. As, as far as I understand, three of you are Ukrainians. You were born in Ukraine. Um, I would like to know uh, the uh, comrades, the people you live with, uh, the detention facility that come from the Russian Federation, were less, were more reluctant. They were uh, less, uh, how to say, happy to to attend this this meeting with the press. Thank you. It looks as, as if this question does not directly refer to the participants of this panel, the question why others were reluctant to join. I can answer your question. 
everyone is afraid that after their exchange, the Russian Federation, there will be problems, there will be charges. They are worried that they will be filled by the Ukrainian television, that they would share truth. And truth is something that Russia is afraid of. It's a very painful thing for, for Russia, the truth. They are afraid that they will face repressions. Why have I come here? I am not going to be exchanged. I'm staying here in Ukraine. I don't give a damn what they think. They call me a traitor now. They, they will kill me. I know there's a criminal proceeding that have been filed against me. So here I feel comfortable. I want to say what I have to say and I'm not going back. From the point of view of the Coordination Center for the Treatment of POW, we are trying to be in line with the fact that we have to restrict the access of the media to the prisoners of war. When we take journalists to those camps, only the prisoners who give their consent to talk to the media, they only they participate in such events. The same goal applies here. You see people who have given their consent to meeting the media. Of course, at a later stage, we can organize another visit where you can see the conditions, you can talk to people, but only with those who will be ready to talk to you. Questions, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, I will be asking in English, please. Mm, guys, uh, from uh, Luhansk and Donetsk. Um, I just wondered, as young people growing up in those two self-proclaimed republics, did you believe some of the propaganda um, that you were hearing and that you were living? And can you give us um, as honest an impression of what life was like in the period running up to the full-scale invasion in February of last year? What was the atmosphere like and what was life like for young people like you? Thank you. Mm. Look, there is a thing I would like to share with you. There is a lot that is we're talking about. Now that I have surrendered all the bullshit that we were told, I didn't believe at any point in time. But what did they say? They said that Ukrainians will come, Ukrainians will cut you into pieces. The teachers that are teaching students, the Ukrainians will come and punish those teachers. There was a lot of rubbish. They were frightening the population of the Donetsk People's Republic. And now people living over there, they, they would, they do not wish to fight with Ukraine, but they are afraid of Ukraine. They have been forced to receive Russian passports. And now that they have the Russian passports, they are afraid of the Rush of the Ukrainian authorities. Now they would rather go with Russia. They they know all the worth of the Russian world that it's not worth anything to put it in a in a decent language. I can tell you personally what I have seen here among other Russian military. They are afraid of getting captured. And I thought too that 
it would be disastrous here. As it turned out, it's different. I was pleasantly surprised. The first medical aid that I was rendered was right there in the trenches with the Ukrainians applied military equipment and tourniquet and they told me everything's gonna fine you will live and this is the way it turned out to be I was evacuated and I spent a week in Kharkiv in the military hospital and I was treated very good the medical personnel the civilians treated me with respect humanely and I was surprised Before I was captured, I was talking to my brethren in, in arms. They, they are afraid of being captured. They rather would blow themselves up. This is what they are ready to do. But I hear I can say that we are treated well. A couple of words about the captivity. Now that I am a second attender of this system, First time when I was exchanged, I thought I was so lucky. No wounds. I spent some time here. I was sent back as a part of the exchange. And after all the procedures that I uh, underwent in Russia, I was sent home to be cured. After the medical revision, we were sent to military units and then unwillingly and I was forced without my consent that I was part of the storm brigade part of the engineering force in first we dug the trenches then r very shortly two days for preparation and we were sent to storm to assault Ukrainian positions now the First time, as I mentioned, I thought I was lucky. Second time, I know and I am convinced how the Ukrainians are treating the prisoners of war. When we were assaulting, I got wounded and uh, my friends who were wounded, but they could walk. They went back, but they didn't care to help me go with them. I was abandoned right there and after that when some time passed and I came to census I found my bearings and I was crawling towards the Ukrainian positions and before that over the radio I heard that the position is in our control but I was crawling and I was getting closer I thought it was 50 50 chance well if I'm not lucky I will be taken prisoner and they will send me home to be treated and I had my doubts because I have already a wound the bullet got under my uh, jacket and uh, bulletproof jacket and they you know just put a plaster on my wound and sent me back now that the Ukrainians have dragged me into the trench they offered me medical aid right there they gave me the painkiller applied the tourniquet and evacuated me to the hospital where I was treated during the hostilities, I was wounded by the mine and the shrapnel uh, got into my lungs and uh, m my lungs were saved by the Ukrainians and ribs that were broken were treated by the Ukrainian doctors. I was operated on in the hospital and I was sent to the camp in the camp the treatment again everyone knows that this is true and the people here know that treatment is very good 
a person, for example, you know, there's a national anthem, all right, the rest time that we have, everything is done comfortably for a human being, for him or her to be treated in a camp. Yes, I'm, I'm waiting for the exchange. You see, I was a criminal. Ten years of imprisonment. On the fourth of next month, this um, charge will be effective, and I want to be exchanged. I would do everything possible not to repeat this. I don't want to fight. I will do everything it takes, possible and impossible, to make sure that I am not getting here again. I am not part of this war. But I was asked by a journalist about the life in, in our region before war. 2019-2021, it was a quiet time. A coronavirus pandemic broke out. There was no war. No one was thinking about war. The situation was like what was like in Tran Transnistria. In general, there was some sign of civilization in the Donetsk region. In the 15 and 6, 2016, you could go to cinema. There were new releases. And, uh, you know, if the movie is released today, then in a six months' time, it would be shown in Donetsk. But in 19 and 2020, there was something of a normalization of life. And here, out of the blue, a special operation. Then it began with the news that Ukraine plans to invade Donetsk, Luhansk regions, and the Russian Federation, which didn't make sense. It was all rubbish. And then Russia recognized Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. When it all broke out, I was in the Donetsk region. Evacuation was announced. There were sirens all over the city. Nothing was happening, but the sirens sounded over the city. Everyone who wanted to get evacuated to Russia, they were paid 2,000 rubles. They would spend 24 hours in Russia and come back. You see, this is a stalemate situation that they created to ensure uh, that Ukraine was planning to invade Lugansk and Donetsk and to find a pretext for Russia to bring forces to protect people of the People's Republics. When it all broke out on the 24th, no jokes, the situation erupted where mobilization was announced. The only thing you have you are left with is to hide. No one wanted this war. No youngster, no young people would think about the need of being protected. It it turned out to be spontaneously this rubbish that you need to go to defend our republics. Prior to 24th of February, there was no word about that. Questions? Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, my name is Lorenzo. I'm coming from Italy. I'm a journalist from Italy. And I would like to ask a question to the three uh, young soldiers from Ukraine, basically from Donetsk and Lugansk. And look, uh, I would like to ask you a question more the, as the civilians, as from <laughs> looking back at your civil life before being soldiers than as soldiers. Uh, you know, many of your citizens left uh, the region where were Donetsk and Lugansk after 2014. We know many of them here. A few, uh, but we know also, we journalists, when we come to your region, Krematorsk, I was a few days ago in Kupiansk, in, uh, in, uh, in the area which are now um, near the war, that there are pro-Russian people. There are pro-Russian people, especially uh, old people, people who are 
nostalgic of Soviet Union. So I would like to ask you, uh, honestly, if you can, uh, uh, of the people who are there, how many are pro-Russian? Are happy of the Russian invasion, of the Russian presence in your, in your region? Вам понятен вопрос? Кто? Кто-то хочет ответить? А, Лоренцо попытался у вас спросить, и вы не всегда были военными, и он бывал на разных... Лоренцо asking you, as people who have not always been soldiers, you used to be civilians, in the territories where you lived, in Luhansk, in Donetsk regions, People that you know, they seem to be supportive of Russia. They support Russians. Uh, Mr. Putin, if you are ready to talk about that. Older generation, I would say 99% are pro-Russians. And you said it right. You put it correctly. They are nostalgic about the Soviet Union. And in, in the Russia of Putin, they see the continuation of the Soviet Union. I remember when Zakharchenko died, people were crying, this is the Soviet Union 2.0. And I'm talking about the older generation. Lion's share of them believe that push Putin is right. They root for Putin. They say, good of you, good for you, President Putin. Younger generation is different. 20 to 25, perhaps, percentage of them. But the majority of them are afraid of Ukraine, but they are not glad about the Russian world. You know, my friend, he is my age, and he is so enthusiastic about the Soviet Union. And there are a lot of young people who believe that Ukraine is a Nazi, fascist country, that we should protect ourselves from it. And they are grateful to Russians that they have brought in their forces to be protected from Ukraine. In general, 60 to 70 percent in general would protect, would uh, support what Putin is doing. As for Lugansk, in general, the situation is like that. But on a separate note, I would say that majority of people believe in the Russian world. These are people who didn't see the war first, first hand. You know, in the downtown of Lugansk, there are no hostilities. There have never been hostilities. Yes, there were some bombings, but real hostilities never took place there. It all goes outside of this city. And those people who have never seen with their own eyes first-hand experience of what war is like, they would support this politics. On the contrary, people who have been to war, people who have seen it, who know the truth about the war and the way the war goes, they would be more reluctant to support. They would be more against, inclined to be against such a politics of war. We will be wrapping up. Last question from, question from Deutsche Wolle, question to Sergei from Mariupol. Were you charged here in Ukraine for fighting against Ukraine? Nikita, what was the charge? What was the article? Were you charged with the fact that you were fighting since 2014? Or the charge is that you have joined Russians after the 24th of February? I was charged with, according with the state um, the state uh, traitor and it, this article provides for the 15 years until the life imprisonment 
my charge is articles 260 in general on summary the aggregate is 10 years of imprisonment 110 article is um, the actions against the sovereignty of U territorial integrity of Ukraine and the other article is participation in the illegal paramilitary formation. Ladies and gentlemen, we are wrapping up this event. I would like you to stay seated where you are, to switch off your cameras. Once again, I would like to thank everybody for joining us. We continue our work. Media Ukraine Center has been happy to have hosted this event thank you for participating we will resume our work for the victory of ukraine and glory to ukraine